Okay, hi everyone, and um, here we are. Externalization of the hierarchy, program 92. And today is the 24th of June, 2020. And we're beginning on page, um, I believe, 687. And that's 689 there. And, well, I'm just going to assume, yeah, it's 687. So, page 687. Okay. Now, what we've been talking about is preparation for the externalization of the hierarchy and all of the training that hierarchy itself and the externalizing masters are undergoing. So let's proceed with that. An intensive training process, therefore, is being carried out in every ashram and along identical lines resulting in the isolation, occultly understood of certain masters and initiates. We remember that um, there's been a reorientation of the majority of the masters uh, towards, uh, the, uh, towards humanity, but a few of the masters have gone deeper in their relationship to Shambhala, thus preserving the balance. Okay, so these masters have been isolated, these in general, in order that they may work more readily and easily with um, Shambhala. Certain masters and initiates have been isolated. Others have uh, <clears throat> reoriented their gaze and their thoughts and their intentions. They can thus form a dynamic and galvanic storehouse of energy, the energy of the divine will, and thus make it available for the use of the other members of the hierarchy as they stand in isolated unity upon the highways of earth and thus are in the world and not yet of the world. We discussed that phrase, in the world yet not of the world. And uh, Christ enunciated that phrase <clears throat> and it is very appropriate for the attitude of uh, isolated unity, which will protect the externalizing masters from the chaos of energies into which they must uh, descend. <clears throat> so in every ashram, this is operating and along identical lines, resulting in the isolation occultly understood of certain masters and initiates. I guess isolated unity is operative in both cases. They have thus also isolated in order that they may work more readily and easily with Shambhala. And yet, when the masters are also walking among men, they have to have that kind of uh, protective isolation, which will ensure that their intentions are not disrupted by the chaos into which they descend. Okay. Okay, so I'm just going to enlarge this a little bit. Certain masters and initiates have been isolated that they may work more readily and easily with Shambhala. They can thus form a dynamic and galvanic storehouse of energy, 
the energy of the divine will and thus make it available for the use of the other members who stand in isolated unity upon the highways of earth. I guess that's clear. Isolation and isolated unity. A balancing situation has been created so that the dynamic will of Shambhala is still available in adequate measure for those who stand upon the highways of earth in isolated unity. Normally, we just don't think of what it will take from the masters who can work so efficiently in their inner retreats to help humanity. We recall that uh, DK said he's been able to help a lot more people from his isolated retreat than he would have had he been uh, uh, externalizing uh, and in the thick of what we call uh, external human life. But the training will uh, see to that. The learning um, going on here. <clears throat> The learning of this lesson calls into activity the sacrificial will of both the hierarchical, hierarchical groups. This remains the binding cord between them and that aspect of the Antikarana along which energy can flow in a new and electric fashion from Shambhala via the hierarchical minority referred to above and into the larger group of masters and initiates and disciples to whom is committed the task of uh, consolidation on the outer plane. All this constitutes for the members of the hierarchy a definite process of testing, testing out and of trial, we sometimes think of them as perfect, but they have their uh, demands if they are to evolve as well, and they certainly are evolving because, you know, there are these cosmic paths lying ahead of them, which are certainly paths of uh, great evolutionary possibilities. So for them, it's a definite process of testing out and of trial prior to and preparatory to some of the higher initiations. Some of those initiations will not even be taken uh, on the earth. Maybe for many initiations, number eight and nine are not taken uh, on earth but maybe on certain sacred planets, which are training planets for a still more uh, cosmic adventure. Now, isn't this type of picture appealing rather than the uh, protected relief of an eternal and illusory heaven state, which pretty much perpetuates, pretty much perpetuates the condition uh, in which uh, the individual uh, passed over. Even the same body with all of its limitations, though perhaps a bit glorified at the resurrection as it is conceived, people accept something as factual, <clears throat> which is far too limiting. It's um, because they don't have the kinds of alternatives presented to them, which uh, spiritual occultism uh, presents. So in, in terms of education, which we can offer, we have to change this anticipation. 
so that they can live in anticipation of something far deeper and wider and more interesting. Again, the members of the hierarchy are not only sensitive to impression from two other planetary centers, Shambhala and hierarchy, but they are acutely aware of the forces of evil which are fighting furiously. That's a Martian word, isn't it? Against the externalization of the spiritual work and the energy which comes, which cosmic evil generates is active along three main channels. So let's see. I mean, you know, think of it. Uh, we're going to pass, we human beings are going to pass through considerable testing during the age of Aquarius, but just think of what the, um, the masters are going to be passing through as they attempt to evoke humanity evoke through invocation, humanity, evoke through invocation, Shambhala, and um, counter in lawful ways. According to law, the machinations of the forces of evil who just want to preserve their own individual selfish prerogatives which <clears throat> uh, demands the enslavement of humanity. It, it's um, a picture of great challenge, but both groups are self-sacrificial. The isolated group, which is concentrating on Shambhala per se, and they of course have achieved isolated unity as masters, and the group which must demonstrate isolated unity as they are oriented to the outer plane and have to remain effective uh, amidst the chaos of energies, uh, which is the habitual condition of the outer plane, at least at this time. Okay. So let's see here. The energy which cosmic evil generates is active along three major channels. Okay. From the center of cosmic evil upon the cosmic astral plane. Of this center, you can know nothing, and its emanations and its magnetic aura can only be understood and recognized or uh, interpreted by the senior masters and by initiates of still higher rank uh, who are already. Uh, residents of Shambhala, Chohans. Um, the, the statement from Master Moria, uh, roughly this, um, you trouble yourselves about a few minor demons while the daggers of Satan are aimed at our backs. So that has something to do with the great battle with cosmic evil, which is undertaken in Shambhala. All right, so that's one place where there is a center which is uh, completely unknown to us and even the center on our own systemic astral plane, the so-called Marakara uh, is a place, the place of illusion, the place of Mara is a place where few would want to visit. And we do hear the story that uh, Madame Rurik did visit that group 
talk about courage and um, assure them of their future destruction and exit unscathed. Well, that is a powerful first ray soul at work. As the potency of the astral plane, which is so familiar to us all, weakens, the glamour and illusion are negated by a rapid spiritualizing of humanity um, and illusion, glamour and illusion are negated. The power of cosmic evil will correspondingly weaken and the forces of evil will be unable to reach the planet with their present easy um, effort. It is against the impact of this emanating evil that the hierarchy stands in protection of humanity. Hitherto, now this is interesting, it has been the task of Shambhala working through the hierarchy to protect humanity from the intention to destroy, you know, the first, it's the first ray dweller, the one, uh, the will to destroy. Yes, the, the, the destroyer of souls, as it's called. So it has been Shambhala through hierarchy, which has provided this, uh, protection for humanity, uh, protecting them, protecting humanity from the intention to destroy of the cosmic forces of evil, but in the coming cycle and as a result of the triumph of the forces of light in the world war, the potency of Shambhala can be combined uh, with that of the protecting agents of light. So this probably means a, uh, a stronger, a stronger uh, amalgamation for the sake of protection. Whoa, that's not it. Protection. <clears throat> and maybe this phrase, um, protecting agents of light, um, refers to hierarchy. It would seem at first sight until clarified as other um, to represent hierarchy. So I'll put that down as a possibility, a possibility. This phrase represents, sorry, the spiritual hierarchy. Okay. So, there will be a weakening of the ability of cosmic evil to reach um, humanity. So, how Shambhala worked through hierarchy, we don't know, but it seems to be a more intense working through, maybe through the inspiration of the Chohans who are members uh, of Shambhala, as well as of hierarchy. And it was really important to win the war. Otherwise, the forces of evil would have had tremendous access to the planet and uh, perhaps created the great explosion of which um, Master DK speaks and uh, 
the wreckage of our planet of which Madame Rorick speaks uh, when dealing with the intention of the evil forces to, as it were, float away on the wreck, float away on a destroyed planet over which they would uh, be the undisputable lords and masters. Okay. So, um, we see that there has been a major victory. There are still battles to be fought, and the last ditch fight of the forces of evil is perhaps not concluded. And even much, much later at the Judgment Day, the planet has to be purged of the influence of these forces operating on an entirely different dimension, perhaps on the dimension of the concrete mind. Okay. So as we weaken, um, let's just put it in here, as planetary glamour is weakened, um, cosmic glamour will also be weakened in its effect on humanity. Uh -huh. There we go. Right now, it's still rather strong, but uh, nothing like what it would have been had the forces of darkness uh, prevailed. Uh, what a huge test, in a way, for our planetary uh, logos. So, this is the first. This is the first channel um, from the evil stored on the, or, or centralized, on the cosmic uh, astral plane. Now, we have to remember that on the second path, um, it's um, magnetic work, and it is um, uh, a type of service which is given from the cosmic astral plane where uh, our normal systemic or solar astral plane is cleansed and purged periodically or constantly by new streams of pure uh, love and uh, by an astral force which is much higher than that of the uh, systemic astral plane. So whatever the negative agencies try to do, it is counterbalanced to an important extent by the masters, many of them interestingly on the fifth ray, and using rose-colored light on the second path as they tend to the uh, purification of our normal astral plane. So it's a great form of service and Cosmic evil tries to corrupt our astral plane and these other masters on that second path uh, see to the balancing of that attempted corruption and uh, send purification, streams of purifying energy where rose light is involved onto our astral plane. Now, we have dealt with the seven paths in various videos um, when dealing with uh, cosmic fire. It is um, an attempt uh, both to offer uh, 
some commentary in written form and also commentary uh, in video form as it became clear that the time schedule would require that. So if you want to listen to the latter part of the analysis of a treatise on cosmic fire via video, these um, paths are discussed. And, you know, since they lie ahead of the masters and they have to be trained uh, to go on these paths, in various training planets, like uh, let's say Jupiter and uh, Venus, uh, maybe others, um, we're not going to understand too much, but enough to give an idea of the major um, accomplishments to be achieved on those paths. And this path, uh, involving Gemini and involving Libra, we learn later, uh, is very essential to the health of our astral plane. So, you know, when we leave our cosmic physical plane through the initiation called refusal, it uh, is perhaps a temporary um, departure because many who leave return, for instance, those who go uh, to Sirius for training as solar angels, they, they become equipped to deal with the cosmic physical plane and with uh, a humanity uh, which is up and coming compared to their particular achieved status. So in the return and the reorientation towards the cosmic physical plane um, is to be expected on these paths. Whether, you know, we're dealing with the highest of the name paths uh, of the path of absolute sonship or the path of the solar logoi, or the path of Sirius to Sirius, as stated, or the path of planetary logoi, I'm going in descending order, or the path of magnetic work. And only when dealing with the path of Earth service is there no immediate departure from the cosmic physical plane and a um, decision prompted by Sanat Kumara for the uh, high initiate to remain with the planet for a certain term to help with the elevation of the planet. And um, it's, it's uh, a very sacrificial path. But one's um, choice is registered before one remains. And uh, right now, Sanat Kumara, we are told, is in need of all these sixth degree initiates. And so they do remain before going on their chosen path. And they remain for a certain term. We don't know what that term is, but uh, we are in the midst of a not just a crisis for humanity, but a planetary crisis. Well, we're trying to bring to bear some of the statements that are made in other places in the book. I said the book, it's a singular. Well, it's like one big book. The books are the book. Okay. Now, we go on to point number two, the energy which cosmic evil <clears throat> generates is active along three lines. Okay. And the second of these lines, 
from the Black Lodge, which is the externalization of the center of cosmic evil on Earth. Okay, now as to what kind of lodge is existing on the cosmic astral plane, uh, some lodge or center of evil, we have no idea. Just that the origin is there, the origin of so much difficulty that's happening with the forces of obstruction that we call the Black Lodge is originating from the place of uh, cosmic evil on the cosmic mental plane. Co oh, I said cosmic mental, cosmic astral plane. There may be, in some cases, uh, just as there are masters who can work from causal levels, there may be um, members of that cosmic center of evil who also work from concrete cosmic mental levels. Somewhere he seems to deal with that, of course, it's completely beyond our range of uh, understanding. But just to lodge in the brain or the mind that these centers do exist is important and more will be understood as necessary. Not that we want to go off speculatively in uh, excess. He tells us that's dangerous and uh, useless, fruitless. So from the Black Lodge, which is the externalization of cosmic evil on the earth. And that's going to probably occur, uh, you know, largely on the systemic astral plane. Let's see what he says here, just as the White Lodge is the representative or correspondence of the cosmic center of light upon Sirius, the true great White Lodge, and we might even sometimes call it the Blue Lodge, just as we call Sirius Blue Star, and um, suggests of Sirius that it has a powerful second ray as a local cosmic Christ. So the Black Lodge is also re representative of ancient and cosmic evil. Ancient, maybe before even the creation of our solar system and our planet. there has to be some kind of correspondence, some kind of greater source. Uh, on the path to Sirius, the fourth path, um, the master leaving the cosmic physical plane travels, if we can use such a word, on the cosmic astral plane. It is not a path to which the cosmic mental plane leads, but uh, Sirius has much more cosmic mental development than our particular solar logos. And our solar logos is working on that type of development. So he does he give a source here of this ancient and cosmic evil? Is it some kind of uh, dark star, as it were, you know, some kind of a stellar center, which is uh, corrupted and disintegrating? There are those kinds of stars which are like cosmic moons, and they are uh, in the process of disintegration. And just as the moon uh, has its nefarious effect upon the earth, so these cosmic moons may as well uh, have a nefarious effect upon our uh, solar system. 
The Black Lodge, no, okay. The Black Lodge is also far more advanced in externalization than is the White Lodge because materialism and matter are for it the line of least resistance. So externalization means coming out in matter and it is a vibrational stage which is resonant with the main um, interest of the Black Lodge. Uh, which has to do with preserving the hegemony uh, of the dense physical levels, which were the material levels of the previous solar system. Well, we're seeking to achieve freedom from the dense non principled bodies of the planetary logos and even the solar logos so we can enter into the cosmically principled life of the cosmic ethers so the black lodge is therefore far more firmly anchored upon the physical plane than is the hierarchy we were not having to talk about are we the externalization of the black lodge the way we talk about the externalization of the hierarchy because it's been around a long time and has established itself. So the Black Lodge is therefore far more firmly anchored upon the physical plane than is the hierarchy. Well, I'll use uh, the green color. Um, the third aspect of divinity is uh, cosmically out of alignment with the others. And although the soul nature of the members of the Black Lodge is largely on the first ray or having the first uh, ray as a sub ray, just as in Hitler's group, um, they came from an earlier system the earlier major system as far as we know a solar, a solar system that is and therefore are closely allied with the third uh third ray okay it requires a much greater effort for the white lodge to clothe itself in matter and work and walk on material levels than for the Black Lodge. Uh, the walk means uh, activity. Owing, however, to the spiritual, whoop, owing, however, uh -huh. yeah, okay, there it is. Owing, however, to the spiritual growth of mankind and to the steady, even if slow, orientation of mankind to the spiritual hierarchy, the time has come when the hierarchy can materialize and meet the enemy of good upon an even footing, you know, on the dense physical levels. Uh, it probably cannot be hierarchy's interest to uh, gain knowledge on the lower planes because it already has that knowledge. However, to sacrifice the higher uh, vibrational levels for the sake of those who are struggling with evil, that is their interest, their Christ-like interest. The hierarchy need not be further handicapped by working in substance. Whilst the forces of evil work both in substance and in matter. See, it's a very old state that hierarchy is uh, re-engaging with. And hence the sacrifice, whatever confines us 
to a lesser uh, uh, locus than otherwise we might have uh, calls for sacrifice. Uh, Sanat Kumara, the great sacrifice, for instance, remaining at his post, not leaving it, even though he would be capable of many uh, greater possibilities for his own advancement. But he's listening, you know, to the planetary logos or of which he is an emanation. And the planetary logos is listening to the great second ray uh, solar logos, in our case, the great heart center. And when the heart is active, the element of sacrifice is uh, expressed uh, intensely. So no longer need the hierarchy be further limited by working only in substance. It can now work in matter as maybe distasteful as that may be and uh, demanding a great patience and the uh, demanding of the relinquishment of still higher spiritual possibilities than we can possibly imagine. Once the reappearance of the Christ and of the hierarchy is an accomplished fact, he says, these forces of evil face sure defeat. And this is uh, encouraging. Um, now, he's also suggesting that we are still in the balances. And that <clears throat> great explosion, which could come from living in an armed camp, which we do, um, is still a vision uh, or a possibility that can be visioned, the Tibetan says. Now, whether or not um, there was given to Foster Bailey an indication that it would not happen, well, we, we just have to take uh, Foster Bailey's word for it. And probably it's a very good word to take. So uh, in the early 1950s, Foster Bailey wrote that he had been assured by the Tibetan that that kind of all destructive war would not occur. And yet we do, um, we do see the makings of a religious war forming upon our planet. Such are the contending forces on the sixth ray as for instance, between militant Christianity and militant Islam, these are Martian and combative religions in one aspect of theirs at least. Once the reappearance has occurred, the forces are of evil face sure defeat. The reason for this is that the trend of human living and thought is turning steadily towards the subjective spiritual values, even if these values are interpreted in terms of material well-being at present and of better living conditions for all with peace and security for all. Well, that's not a bad thing either, is it? That is uh, very acceptable as a transitional uh, stage. It is uh, materialism of a kind, but remember during the Aquarian age, we will be understanding far more of what we could call um, spiritual materialism. Does it sound contradictory? It would be the use of matter and etheric substance for the advancement of the plan and not uh, seeing a matter per se as 
obstructive. So human beings are turning towards a better way of life with uh, sharing as a possibility, with uh, peace emerging, with uh, a, a house cleaning uh, having occurred, so the corruption is reduced. All of these things are on the way. The Black Lodge or the planetary um, center of evil works almost entirely upon the astral plane and is impressed directly and guided in detail from the cosmic astral plane. Now that is a important statement. Shambhala deals with cosmic evil and planetary evil, though in a sense more natural, will certainly wane and uh, vice versa as we have the waning of planetary evil the conduit for cosmic evil will be greatly reduced it's hard to say that the love of money is the root of all evil let's just say that um, evil uh, that limiting desire which uh, prevents the wonder of the divine plan from unfolding on behalf of the various kingdoms of nature and as far as our studies go, as far as uh, the unfolding within humanity, that that low desire is the root of evil. And if I were to look at the illusion behind it all, it is a misidentification. which is the root of evil. We think we are a limited personal thing. And in fact, our deeper identity achieved through identification reveals something very different as to our true nature, our true identity. Now let's go on. Uh, we've been looking at Um, what have we been looking at here? Oh, yeah. The energy which cosmic evil generates is active uh, along three channels. From the center of cosmic evil and also from the center on the systemic planes, which we might call planetary evil and uh, offering us the problem with the Black Lodge with which we are more familiar. Those Black Lodge members, um, six leaders in the East, six leaders in the West, he doesn't elaborate, are subject to what kind of beings on the cosmic astral plane. Nothing is spoken about them and occasionally uh, a little bit is spoken about the evil leaders uh, on the systemic uh, astral plane, or at least within the dense physical body of our planetary logos. Uh, in the secret doctrine, there is some of that, and uh, a major Atlantean, they call him a demon. Uh, I don't even remember the name, I kind of remember it, but I don't want to get into it, uh, is perhaps still very active, having, uh, you know, raised hell in the Atlantean period. So anyway, the evil can also come from the negative or purely material forces of the planet, which are not necessarily either good or bad, but which have been used instinctually and <clears throat> often unconsciously by humanity and for purely material ends, and are therefore basically anti-spiritual and subject to the influence of human desire, a desire oriented towards 
selfishness and towards separativeness. Well, it's a bit like I've been trying to say here, low desire involving uh, low uh, elemental forces uh, can be a great uh, cause of obstruction. This form of evil is being combated today by the new group of world servers. Let's say the servers are up to this type of resistant elemental evil. They're certainly not up to dealing with the Black Lodge directly. And um, as far as cosmic evil goes, well, you know, certainly not. And one cannot speculate who can really deal and on what level with cosmic evil. We hear about Shambhala being able to do it. And now increasingly hierarchy is involved in the battle, but not the servers. They still have to confine themselves to the immediate uh, obstruction around them. And there is still so much, so many uh, resistant obstructive conditions which have to be uh, alleviated. You know, there is uh, poverty, there is uh, starvation, there is ignorance. There's, you know, lack of education. Uh, there is uh, all kinds of sexual abuse. All of these immediate factors have to be isolated and prominent humanitarians know it and are attempting for whatever karmic reason to deal with it. I would say, you know, groups like ours, we're trying to deal with human ignorance, which is considered in Buddhism maybe the greatest sin. We're trying to give a much more accurate view of life and especially an inner life and its relation to the uh, normally experienced outer life. It's a relationship with which most thinkers have not succeeded in um, seeing with accuracy. Nor do we completely see with accuracy, no, but maybe because of the Tibetan and the will to illuminate humanity of the Christ and Sanat Kumara and his hierarchy, we see more and must share it. So this form of evil, this um, dealing with the negative or purely material forces of the planet um, is being combated by the new group of world servers, by the people of goodwill who want to do good in the world and who want to alleviate unacceptable, intolerable, intolerable conditions. So the new group is uh, combating this and of this battle you know something because every thinking man and woman is immediately implicated you know, trying to see normal conditions improved. There are these um, goals within the United Nations. Are there 17 such goals at the moment of improvements which must be made and they are understandable by every person of goodwill and even more by those who are totally committed to service, uh, such as the new group of world servers is. Okay, I have spoken of the evil present in the planet in a very, in very simple terms. And there are phases uh, of it to which I have not referred. The interlocking and interpenetrating of the grades of evil 
are far more numerous and intricate than you can surmise. And uh, Master Moria deals with this too, talking about the, uh, the Black Lodge. Um, you know, behind the somewhat gray one is the more gray one. And it darkens as we go until we reach the Black Lodge. So there are many grades of obstruction and uh, many grades of worker on the opposite side um, who are seeking to thwart the divine plan from materializing on our planet. I guess evil can be found on every ray. And uh, well, because there are just, there are human beings who just still have um, uh, evil within them that has not been redeemed and they are on all the rays and you know any negativity associated with any ray can be considered obstructive so there are uh, he gives us you know the destroyer of souls on the first ray the deluder of souls on the second ray and the mm, manipulator of souls on the third ray and uh, you know we have war on the fourth ray and we have uh, narrow mental materialism and skepticism on the fifth ray and we have blazing fanaticism on the sixth ray and we have uh, superficial rigidity on the seventh ray we can find misuse of ray energy and thus obstruction on any one of the rays and we have to purge ourselves of these things these states in order to be of greater help with the divine plan so he goes on and says, in summing up, I do have two keyboards here, you know, <laughs> and that allows me to type the letter E without pounding the keyboard just to get some slight response. One day when I have a little time, I'll get it fixed. But a second keyboard has helped. In summing up, I would say that the present reorientation of the hierarchy in relation to Shambhala and to humanity, remember a certain group of masters reorienting intensely to Shambhala and the uh, majority reorienting towards humanity, with the first group being under a special type of isolation and the second group defending their future work through isolated unity which is something you know we can begin to think about at the third degree and maybe before i would say that the present reorientation of the hierarchy in relation to both shambhala and to humanity ushers in the cycle of complete defeat of cosmic evil upon our planet, leaving only an isolated and weakened Black Lodge to die a slow death. This permits the purification of human desire to such an extent that, quote, matter will be redeemed by the sacrificial will of those who know, by the will to good of those who are and the goodwill of those sons of men who have turned their faces to the light and who in turn reflect that light. 
And there is that, you know, beautiful mantra, he who faces towards the light and stands within its radiance is blinded to the issues of the world of men. He passes on his way to the great center of absorption. But he who longs to pass that way, yet loves his brother upon the darkened path, revolves upon the pedestal light, a pedestal of light, and turns the other way. Uh, and then the seven, well, whatever it is, the seven streams uh, uh, move toward humanity. You can tell where my memory is breaking down here. Uh, and those upon the darkened path, the seven centers within himself, uh, and those upon the darkened path receive that light. For them, the way is not so dark. Behind the warriors, twixt the light and dark, blazes the light of hierarchy. Well, I, I like that one uh, very much. And um, let's see here. Um, uh, for them, the way is not so dark. So if you would go to, um, let's see if I can get this correctly. It's here. And this is it, which I will uh, highlight. Yes. But he who feels the urge to pass that way, yet loves his brother on the darkened path, revolves upon the pedestal of light and turns the other way. It's much better in DK's words rather than my own uh, kind of improvised words. He faces towards the dark and then the seven points of light within himself transmit the outward streaming light, and lo, the face of those upon the darkened way receives that light, for them the way is not so dark. And those who do this are the warriors. Behind the warriors, twixt the light and dark, blazes the light of hierarchy. This is from Discipleship in the New Age, uh, volume two and page. 15. It's a beautiful thing, and uh, I would recommend to myself the rememorizing of it, and to you, I would, if you haven't given it a try to memorize, I would recommend that. <laughs> All right. Now I hope that this is uh, correct. Okay. So he's summing up here. The defeat of cosmic evil, and they will be left to die a slow death. Now there are challenges ahead, and the great judgment day uh, deals with lesser energies and greater energies and the dividing of the greater from the lesser, so that found upon our planet will only be uh, those human beings who are on the path. So some forces of obstruction, either an insufficiently developed uh, concrete mind or an overly developed concrete mind will have to be shunted off to other places of re-education. 
And then this amazing statement, which probably comes from one of the masters, he doesn't say, it, it looks obviously like the old commentary. And this permits the purification of human desire because the Black Lodge will be, at least at this time, gone. And we read that matter will be redeemed by the sacrificial will of those, capital T, who know. So that's the knowledge basis. By the will to good of those who are. So they have mastered the um, understanding and the demonstration of being, what being can confer. And they carry the will to good and by the goodwill, that's love, love in action of those sons of men who have turned their faces to the light and who in turn reflect that light. Now this is coming as the Black Lodge is defeated. And it's a very encouraging, very encouraging kind of uh, statement from the old commentary. The purification of human desire and when human desire is purified, obviously a reoriented aspirational spiritualized desire will not allow uh, evil to sweep over humanity as it has in the past. It will be occultly deflected. And we're in that battle right now. We can see evil again attempting to emerge. And it's fighting. Has the last ditch stand of materialism been fought through? I would say not. And, you know, the third ray is a great danger in its materialistic aspect because it's so easy for backward looking humanity to fall into those old and well established tendency. So we have to fight against materialism in our own life and to try to educate um, humanity so that uh, more human beings understand the limitations which their materialistic thought is placing upon their possibilities. <clears throat> As all disciples know, one of the problems with which they are constantly confronted is an extreme sensitivity to the thought currents of those with whom they are immediately in contact. The more advanced the disciple, the greater his problem. Well, you know, the masters are facing this, right? I mean, they're going to be going into the thick of things, aren't they? And they need some kind of isolated unity to protect their capacities, which are meant to offer redemptive service to humanity. It's no use coming in with compromised instruments or in such a state that the instrument can be uh, easily compromised, the service would be ineffective, ineffective. And thus, the kind of training and reorganization interiorly that is going on in the higher places, which are waiting to descend upon the planet. The theory that if one lives and works on a high level of consciousness, one is immune to that which emanates from the lower levels, 
does not in practice hold good. Um, I'm recalling something I read that uh, Master R, maybe when he was the Count, I'm not sure, but Master R fell ill because of the um, lack of discretion or uh, improper behavior of one of his disciples. It just telegraphed directly to him. So the occult law proclaims that the greater can always include the lesser. And just as that is true of the planetary logos, who is the sum total of all lesser forms within his manifested universe, Notice uh, universe, the use of the word universe in a different way, um, suggesting a much something much smaller in scope, but uh, coming out of one hierarchy. So the same law applies to human beings. Okay, so the masters are still susceptible is what this uh, seems to say <clears throat> and um, does not hold good so i'm going to put that in there okay the masters are still susceptible the occult law proclaims that the greater can always include the lesser. Well, you know, maybe there's an analogy uh, that parents are certainly susceptible and suffer from the misdeeds of their children. Now, the other is also true, terribly true in some cases but there will not be misdeeds from the spiritual parental guidance of a master whereas the human parent may make dreadful mistakes but they are susceptible to what their children do so uh, this is um just as that is true of the planetary logos okay the disciple therefore can always include that which emanates from those who are below him on the ladder of evolution. The more a disciple is under the influence of the law of love, you know, the second ray types are the absorbers. And I suppose even if one is not a second ray type, every member of the hierarchy knows something about the love. Um, the more a disciple is under the influence of the law of love, the more easily does he tune in and absorb the thoughts and register the desires of those around him, particularly and particularly of those who are tied to him in the bonds of affection and of karmic relation. As disciples proceed from initiation to initiation, the will aspect fortifies the intellect and directs the expression of the energy of love and thus the problem lessens. For the initiate learns certain protective rules which are not available to the neophyte. Well, we uh, do suffer from our association with each other, and especially if we are uh, embracing um, the psyches of those who are learning from us or are associated with us, uh, as it says here, those who are below him on the ladder of evolution and over which uh, he has a watchful eye. something to think about you know normally we are 
self-centered and we don't think about our effect upon those whose psyches include our own. And we don't think of the reasons here, you know, their, their love uh, makes them more sensitive to our own misdeeds. So the more a disciple is under the influence of the law of love, it is a the sixth systemic law we may remember. And of course, the law of magnetic impulse, a law of the soul is involved here, and that brings in the second ray. The more easily does he tune in and absorb the thoughts and register the desires of those around him. They can be very painful and discordant when compared with that which the supervisor has achieved and particularly of those who are tied to him in the bonds of affection and karmic relations. And this is the uh, DK deals with the suffering of parents in, in esoteric psychology too, the suffering of parents who hold their children too close. But apparently here there are uh, remedies to that situation. So as disciples proceed from initiation to initiation, the will aspect fortifies the intellect and directs the expression of the energy of love, which becomes more true love than sentimental affection along the love line. The initiate learns certain protective rules which are not available to the neophyte. The latter must learn, first of all, how to identify himself with others as the basis of a higher identification which conditions the senior initiates. That's um, at least the fourth degree, I would say, in the scale of being. So there is pain on our planet in esoteric psychology too. DK deals with pain in a masterful way. And he gives us all of its advantages, but he does not spare us an understanding of the pain of pain, you know, the ability uh, to suffer, which accompanies uh, subjection to pain. And yet, uh, associated as it is, especially with the second ray and the fourth ray, the path of moving through pain is a fast path, relatively. So the will aspect fortifies the intellect and directs the expression of the energy of love because it can happen earlier than that just spontaneously and uh, without control and thus the suffering of detachment when it comes well the masters are exquisitely sensitive but they know more and they do not perhaps suffer over the things which induce suffering in the average uh, aspirant or disciple. The preparation of the members of the ashram found within the hierarchy who must emerge from their retreats and live among men in the ordinary intercourse of daily life has necessitated much discussion and instituted a drastic training system within the ashrams. Oof. DK seems to be repeating this idea from various perspectives. It's a real thing. 
the fact that, uh, or the thought that, the hierarchy can, uh, as a body, march outward and uh, conquer all adversity in a commanding manner has very little truth in it. They will conquer, but um, they are human beings just as we are, and they are graduate human beings, and they have to find themselves equal to the task. They have to prepare themselves to be equal to the task. A dramatic training system is instituted. How are we to know what that is? Well, something about insulation, something about isolated unity is involved. Into the nature of this training I cannot enter, he says, for it differs for disciples upon the various rays, and the theme is too large at this point for our purpose. Okay, well, we, it's enough for us to know that the training uh, is occurring. And necessarily so, and that our idea of what the masters are is often inflated, and they themselves find it a, a source of amusement how high, highly we rate them out of all proportion to what they have achieved. I mean, an example of this, of course, is to rate the Christ as the only Son of God in the entire universe. We can see how there has been a, a cramping of the whole um, uh, assessment. We're not capable of including even our local cosmos system, even our galaxy. Of course, this is dealt with by imagining that those vast systems are simply inanimate and are made of uh, matter and stuff and have no internal um, identity within them. So when you eliminate the possibility of soul from the vast reaches of space, you can say whatever and, and come to believe it. Well, we're no longer, most of us, the victim of medieval thought, which we can understand uh, was profoundly ignorant. And we can understand why Master R, uh, as uh, Francis Bacon had to come in there and disrupt the limitations of scholasticism and substitute for it scientific investigation so one could see for oneself and prove what is true and what is not true instead of just piling ideas upon ideas or thoughts upon thoughts. The problem, says DK, has been how to preserve the sympathetic, sensitive rapport and to lay the basis for the higher inclusive identification, <clears throat> and yet at the same time preserve a spiritual detachment which will enable the disciple <clears throat> to do his needed work unhampered and unimpeded by the distress, the anxiety, or the thought activity evoked by the minds and the desires of those with whom he is working. Well, he's, he's been repeating this idea, this thought. When I use the word idea sometimes, it means thought, and occasionally it means what a true idea is. How do we do this? 
How do we remain sensitive and yet protected for the sake of efficiency in service, <clears throat> in service of the divine plan, <clears throat> in service uh, of the divine purpose? How do we do it? I'll read it again <clears throat> because I think it has to come into focus. The problem has been how to preserve the sympathetic, sensitive rapport and to lay the basis for the higher inclusive identification, which of course is only uh, possible when sensitivity is very great, and yet, at the same time, preserve a spiritual detachment. That's the isolated unity, perhaps, <clears throat> excuse me, which will enable the disciple to do his needed work unhampered and unimpeded by the distress. Humanity is filled with it. <clears throat> the anxiety, humanity is filled with it, or the thought activity evoked by the minds and the desires of those with whom he is working. You know, the presence of the master is not going to be an easy encounter for the majority of the disciples. That's the master in the flesh, as it were. The students of DK found the pressure of his thought to be a difficult encounter. They were not, you know, in general, seeing him uh, as he is in terms of visual image, and they had an intermediary in Alice Bailey who could bring through uh, what the master intended to communicate. So even though it was not a direct encounter in a physical, visible manner, it was pressureful. And um, DK sometimes wondered, could they stand the pressure of it? And uh, he did at times moderate his approach compared to what he intended to do. And Alice Bailey actually at times uh, advised him where moderation was necessary because he would tend to be uh, direct and truthful and not spare the feelings of those to whom he imparted the truth. Well, uh, they worked it out so that the Tibetan's letters became uh, masterful examples of how to deal psycho-spiritually with a often troubled, though advancing, disciple. <coughs> I keep on hoping that I'm doing this correctly. Sometimes I've gone through these uh, commentaries only to discover that the text uh, on the uh, page never, cha never changed. <laughs> and that, of course, is uh, not desirable. The, okay. the necessary detachment cannot be based upon the innate instinct of self-preservation, even when that is carried into the realm of the soul. In other words, it's not a question of the master's comfort. That cannot be the motive for the attached detachment which he must achieve when in the thick of human living. 
it must be motivated by an occult absorption in the task and implemented by the will which keeps the channel of contact open between the disciple and the ashram and between the disciple and his sphere of activity. This channel must be kept entirely clear of all lower identifications. This might be termed a method of eliminating all tendencies to register anything save a wise apprehension of the point in evolution of those contacted, a sound appreciation of the problem to be faced on their behalf, and a process of directing the needed energy of love in such a manner that the stream of projected love not only aids the recipient, but protects the disciple from undue contact. This is so masterful. It will then evoke in the person to be helped or the group to be aided, no reciprocal personality expression. Instead, it lifts the entire quality of the personality life or the group life on the purificatory way to higher levels of awareness. So this is how the master must operate and not in any way that evokes an obstructive personality stream of energy in the disciple that he would help. I find this really uh, such good advice, you know, even on our own level. If we have not overcome personality ourselves, and it really, it really isn't overcome until the third initiation, the ancient domination of the personality is overcome at the third degree, then we are going to evoke a personal response, which is often obstructive in, in those we seek to help. So we have to be very sensitive and yet um, not evoke that personality response. It cannot be based upon self-preservation, even preservation of one's own soul comfort or soul uh, state, which is uh, ag agreeable and uh, well-functioning. It cannot have the motive of selfishness, even though the type of selfishness is very refined, you might say, well, at least I'm allowed to preserve the integrity of my own soul and not be disconcerted by that which is evoked. But that can't be the motive. One takes, one utilizes methods to prevent a disruption, because disruption means ineffectiveness in service but that cannot be the motive the motive is uh, a cult absorption in the task so you know the task has seen and understood from higher dimensions and implemented by the will so we don't deviate which keeps the channel of contact open between the disciple and the ashram. So the steady stream of helpful energy reaches the disciple without any uh, impediment and between the disciple and his sphere of activity. And this channel from ashram to disciple to the sphere of activity. Okay, let's look at that a channel exists 
uh, between the ashram, the disciple, and the sphere of activity, this channel must be kept entirely free of all lower identifications. We know how often we can prevent our own effectiveness because we are attracted uh, to what uh, unfitting desires indicate as desirable. So a very clear focusing and an expulsion of um, lower attractions and desires is needed and the master has to be careful how he approaches so that that kind of evocation does not occur. So this might, all this might be termed a method of eliminating all tendencies to register anything except a wise appreciation of the point in evolution of those contacted, and this is from the master's perspective, a sound appreciation of the problem to be faced on behalf of the disciple, on their behalf, and a process of directing the needed energy of love in such a manner that the stream projected, a projected love, not only aids the recipient, but protects the disciple from undue contact, maybe lower contact and maybe overstimulating contact from the ashram, because overstimulation can be as great a problem, a method. And then it will work. It will work. And the master's helpfulness will be real helpfulness, and the disciple will not find uh, himself or herself off the track, desiring that which is uh, ancillary, not germane or over stimulated. So it will then evoke, this is all from the master's point of view, it will then evoke in the person to be helped or the group to be aided. Notice both. No reciprocal personality expression. You know, we probably, if we have been mentors or secretaries or those who tried to help, we have probably at times evoked reciprocal personality expression. I know I have, I wasn't intending it, but I got a personality reaction out of the student I was trying to assist and that showed that something was imperfect in my own approach. Instead of reciprocal personality expression, it lifts the entire quality of the personality life or the group life on the purificatory way onto higher levels of awareness. So what caution, we say, you know, um, uh, what great caution the master must exert in approaching the disciples, that's discipleship, uh, he would help. I guess in all of this, work that we're studying, we're understanding something about the problems the master faces, which is good, um, as we tend to be fixated usually upon our own uh, problems.
A great part of the work to be done by disciples who are emerging from the ashrams and will continue thus to emerge is of a purificatory nature at this time and in increasingly so for the rest of the century. Well, right now, we are 20 years into the new century. And maybe some of us who are older have experienced this uh, necessity to engage in purificatory work for ourselves and for others. On the path of probation, the Tibetan says, the aspirant is taught to purify himself and his three vehicles of contact. Upon acceptance into an ashram, what can we call it, accepted discipleship, a large measure of the needed purification has been achieved, but not all, okay? That we could see from the letters uh, written to his disciples. From then on, this is important as the bodily disciplines and uh, other related disciplines uh, tend to be foremost in the minds of many who should have passed them by or worked through them. From then on, no emphasis should be laid by the disciple on the purification of his own nature. For this would produce too close and intimate a self-focus and tend to an overstimulation of the personality vehicles. Okay, so we're learning something um, about purification and when it is uh, appropriate and when it has to be discontinued. Okay, because we know, you know, DK tells us that we spend too much time uh, in the lesser disciplines and we, especially the physical disciplines, and we overlook uh, the loveliness of the emotional life. The word loveliness was used and the real clarity of the mind and its um, cultivation as a very useful instrument of discernment. So we learn that purification has its place, but it must not be excessively continued. And many people do forget that, and they think, as DK has told us, that doing the right thing physically means that they are spiritually progressing. But there are problems. It can produce the self-focus and over-stimulation. It can produce too close and intimate a self-focus, and then we become obsessed with our own estimation of ourselves as disciples and we tend to forget what is really needed in the service we intend to share. Uh, and also an overstimulation of the personality vehicles. We have to take our eyes off our personal self. Not easy uh, to do because they have been there for so many centuries and millennia. And finally, we begin to awaken to greater possibilities if we will only renounce and relinquish that which has become habitual in our lives, but which is limiting our spiritual development. But nevertheless, the lessons learned upon the probationary path will be found by him to be simply the foundation for the science of purification. 
or if I may use a word more familiar to you, through the war experience, de decontamination of the contamination. You know, we always have these lesser lives which remind us that we must uh, protect each other and ourselves from uh, disintegration. What is the function of a virus, of bacteria? They definitely have functions and it is to, I think, help to strengthen the vehicle of uh, the human being. The first ray department is ever looking in on the strength of the vehicles of disciples so that they can bear, so that they can withstand the additional energy which will be um, focused upon them. So purification is a basis. We don't expect someone to have gone through the purification and suddenly begin to do those things which are impure because he says well i've been through purification that's that and only lesser disciples pass uh, our, our intent upon purification and i'm a greater disciple so i don't have to worry about it you know um, that is probably not to be expected and should not be expected. So we've got this um, foundation for the science of purification or the science of decontamination. Well, look what's going on with this current pandemic. Decontamination is a constant concern and you see these people uh, spraying uh, decontaminating agents very liberally in public places so that um, there is protection for the people. All this, this will be brought into full expression by the working disciples who will be responsible for the preparation of the world for the appearance. <clears throat> so purification is still very necessary, but helping, going through it oneself, mastering the necessary purifications and then letting it go as one attempts to instruct others regarding the process. I think I'll just use that same, that same color. So the purificatory process huh, falls into the following stages. It's uh, everything the Tibetan rites, aspects, everything else has a influence on everything else and contributes to the greater understanding of everything else that he writes. So the purificatory process falls into the following stages and this looks important. You know, you sometimes wonder how is it possible to absorb all that he has given, and it, it really isn't possible. But if we keep our studies regular and consistent, we will find a way. We will find a way to absorb what we can. And it will be a much greater absorption than if we just treat what he has written as uh, casual or 
treated in a casual manner. So what about this purificatory process? And can we recognize that we are engaged in it in any way in our lives? Number one, the stage where in the tainted area, the hidden evil or the diseased factor factors are recognized and duly contacted in order to ascertain the extent of the purificatory measures required. This is a point of danger for the disciple. Well, it's the contact with the evil itself. And uh, further contamination is also possible. That's why he tells us that speculation about the Black Lodge is both, uh, I think he uses the word fruitless and dangerous. And, you know, this looks like a very medical type of procedure. It's diagnosis, how deeply uh, has the disease penetrated? How widely has it spread? And what is required to rid the system of it? It can be physical, psychological, mental, you know, certain mental ide fix and psychological, uh, astral, glamorous responses, or it can simply be physical contamination. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> then the next aspect of the purificatory process, the process of discovering the magnetic areas magnetized in past centuries and even eons by members of the hierarchy. This is done so as to make available the transmission of energies there stored. You know, you go to places which have the reputation of carrying the healing energies, and some places do. In the cycle which is now close at hand, these magnetic centers will be largely tapped or utilized by the world disciples responsible for the purificatory work. How do we put ourselves in touch with the healing energies? Healing will be a question of magnetism, of sound, of color, of changing the energy uh, condition of altering the vibratory states. So this is a positive. It's the negative and the positive. And then the third factor, the stage wherein the disciple withdraws his attention from the source of difficulty and concentrates upon certain mantric usages and certain hierarchical formulas, thus setting loose the energies needed to destroy the germs of evil, latent or active, thus eliminating certain materialistic tendencies and strengthening the soul of all that is to be purified. You know, the very first law of the soul has to do with the circulation of soul life in throughout the personality. And then disease is no longer possible. The strengthening of the soul and of all that is to be purified and the life to be found within every form. <clears throat> it is wise to remember that, for instance, as the master works his disciple with his disciples and strengthens the life within them and evokes their soul into potency from latency, every form and every atom. 
within the various bodies is equally energized and aided. It is this fundamental process which will guide the disciples and the initiates in the coming work of purification. Well, mantric usages and certain hierarchical formulas. So we know um, where the trouble is. We know something about the magnetic energy and areas uh, on the earth where healing from whence healing can proceed. And we are involved in um, releasing via mantrams. the healing energies. We are involved in this. Now probably all of us can uh, at least use our imagination to understand how we might decontaminate certain areas within our system by assessing the difficulty perhaps knowing where to retreat, although sometimes that's not possible, and knowing the mantrams of release, and if we don't know them yet, we will have to create them according to what we know. And we can create mantrams and positive thoughts which will release energies uh, into the tainted uh, areas. And then the stage of withdrawing of the purifying energies, and this is to be followed by a period of stabilizing the purified form and starting the life and soul within it on a new cycle of spiritual growth. This is really beautifully simplified by a master healer for us. And I think it's really well to remember <coughs> these four stages of the purificatory process. And I think, you know, all of us need this in one area or other of our personality, but must not become obsessed with it. Our major work is helping others, but unless we are in a certain reasonable, instrumental condition, we cannot really help otherwise, help others as otherwise we could. I think as we come closer to understanding the work of the devas, <clears throat> we will be led to those magnetized areas from whence uh, healing can flow, as in number two here. And then come the mantram mantrams, and then comes the withdrawal of the purifying energies, and then stabilizing and starting anew, starting afresh. So, you know, let's study this. We can learn how it is to be done. It doesn't seem that difficult. Well, to be a true master of the process would be more difficult, but uh, that will take time. But at least to recognize that the areas of purification uh, 
or the areas which around us which need purification that we can do and when i say areas i mean relationships too and you know not only environmental circumstances but interactions they may need purification okay so this is the science of applied purification and it's really important area here but you know since we've gone about two hours i think uh, i'll try to finish up what remains in another program and uh, 693 that's where we are <laughs> so 687 basically uh to 693 and the date the 24th of june now i'll copy that a little housekeeping you know i'm not a good housekeeper i'm afraid but we can all learn can't we the soul will always balance what we need. You know, the note of the causal body is sounded forth or the chord or its general sound and it is noted what is required for balancing. DK gives some very good examples of that in the beginning of Letters on Occult Meditation. The average... Uh, the average disciple maybe does not have as much of the fifth ray as needed because uh, at least in our group uh, we've been trained as mystics so the fifth ray may be offered as a supplementation to appear in the personality maybe or the mental vehicle all of that can be engineered from the level of the soul so this is um, number 24 and we're going to begin number 92 93 and i don't know if it will be today i hope so we do have another broadcast coming up but uh, one tries to seize the hour as best one can all right so lots of love many blessings study with acuity with mental acuity as much as possible and trust yourself in meditation because you have within yourself a great source of wisdom you can access it and dk has helped us learn how to access it through various meditations and forms of meditation and basically you know keep the channel clear as much as possible There are times when service <clears throat> can be a great uh, type of meditation and meditation a great service. So let's just continue our service knowing we can't do it all. We can only do a tiny portion of what is needed, but let us assess what it is that is needed and that of which we are capable and do what we can with reasonable consistency avoiding the uh, rocks of fanaticism i speak to myself in that one okay thank you
and we'll be back with number 93.